first speaker today, and I'll again ask each of the panelists to do a little bit of an introduction of, of their own um, uh, company. But our first speaker today is, is uh, Paul Richardson. Uh, he's the Vice President of Sales um, for the Aviation Supply Chain Group in, in Asia Pacific of AAR Corporation. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's having a great air show. <clears throat> I'm a little bit hoarse, been too much uh, talking today already. Um, Yes, as mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Sales for AAR's Aviation Supply Chain Group. AAR is, uh, is a $2 billion US, uh, uh, $2 billion corporation headquartered in, uh, in uh, the United States, um, covering a, a various uh, breadth of uh, capabilities and services from military through to commercial. Um, an element of that, obviously, is the, uh, the supply chain management. And, uh, you know, to say it's a complicated beast is an understatement. Um, supply chain solutions tend to uh, have a difficulty in uh, keeping up, especially when you consider the, some of the, uh, the, the key trends in the marketplace. We see uh, new fleet emergence, and the new fleet emergence uh, 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 brings along um, new part numbers, new technology, and as a, res a result of that, you have unknown MTBRs, you have unknown soft time, um, and essentially an unknown true cost. Um, Another trend, you see rapid fleet retirements. We see that a lot in Asia itself. Um, and these um, fleet retirements uh, are essentially creating inventory tails. Um, so as, uh, as a result, the, the, the organizations themselves have uh, obviously break even costs that uh, they get exposed to. So as a result of that, you're seeing a lot, a lot, a lot more, more outsourcing as a trend. Um, MROs and operators are looking at uh, uh, supply chain solutions uh, to, to, I guess, to minimize the, uh, the risk as best as possible. Um, some of the key considerations, um, there are many. Um, we always look at, uh, the, the, we always highlight the cost containment. It's typically considered one of the uh, number one management responsibilities. Um, you have to be careful, I guess, from, uh, from a cost containment side of things because um, you know, the cost volatility tends to create issues of the day, fuel prices. And so when we start looking at the cost side, we can create an imbalance between the, uh, the service as well that's uh, ultimately going to impact the, uh, the revenue. So there's a delicate uh, balance in that side of things. Um, visibility in the supply chain, probably one of the greatest management challenges that, uh, that's out there. Uh, ensuring the data and the information is available to the people that need it. That's a critical element to be considered. Uh, and managing customer demands. Uh, we tend to see, we, you know, we've been fallible as, as well, we tend to see we have a, uh, more of a uh, connection with our suppliers than actually our, our customers itself. Uh, and again, that goes back to some of the cost versus uh, service uh, imbalance and that needs to be, uh, I guess, a, a key consideration. So when we talk about some of the best practices to ensure that we have um, optimized uh, supply chain solutions resulting in just in time, you know, there is a, uh, there's a supply chain analysis that needs to be done in order to, uh, to, to create this optimization. And that uh, considers some of the points there in process governance, uh, data, um, performance management, risk, planning, resources. Um, these are all, all, all key parts of the optimization uh, to ensure that uh, we have our proper just-in-time services out there in the marketplace. It was an interesting... Um, an interesting uh, dialogue a few years back uh, with one of the major OEMs in China, uh, and they essentially said that they've adopted this new IT system, um, but they didn't take into consideration the, the, the process governance required in terms of making sure that material moved as quickly as possible to the customer itself. They essentially said, we'll put the inventory into China, uh, and when people started asking what's the best uh, place in Asia in terms of uh, getting your, the parts into China, they ended up saying it was from Singapore because they hadn't necessarily looked at what the requirements and restraints are from a process side of things within China itself. So it's an interesting part of that. You can ultimately go uh, um, uh, adopt a strategy in terms of looking at some of the IT solutions that are available. But you have to be careful in terms of uh, creating an imbalance in your service at the end result. Uh, because of the, the, obviously the, uh, the uh, lack of consideration from the process side of things. So essentially we say, you know, be careful not to optimize an already inefficient supply chain. Look at all these elements prior to adopting the best practices from a just-in-time solution. So uh, the last, I guess the, one of the last points that we have, um, we, always, we, always say, we always say share, collaborate and interact. 
those best practices, those people that uh, obviously have um, supply chain solutions uh, of excellence that create uh, excellent just-in-time, those people will obviously take into consideration the sharing of information um, and the collaboration in terms of making sure that there's a full visibility. Paul, thank you very much. Um, next up is uh, John Rasher, who's the uh, A&D Consulting Leader Americas for CSE. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, first just thank the folks at the embassy that have been so helpful in getting me here and getting me prepared. Mr. Administrator, it's good to see you again. The folks at Commerce have been great. And I want to thank my colleague, uh, Duncan Foster, who's in the audience that pretty much made this all happen for me. Um, I do have the, the privilege of being the Aerospace and Defense Leader Americas for Computer Sciences Corporation. CSC is a $15 billion plus or minus uh, a few dollars, I suppose. Business transformation, consulting, information technology, systems integration, and information technology outsourcing company. Um, in A&D, our work coupled with our work in what we call the national public sector, for folks like the FAA, other departments of the government, it represents the largest sector uh, in CSC, where we do, do a ton of work. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. I am delighted that the topic today is how do we integrate the supply chain and MRO. Um, I just say it's about time. Okay, this is one of the most difficult challenges we face uh, and have faced for decades. And as consumers of air transport, we understand how difficult this is when we get that notice that says, gosh, the airplane's broken. We'll call you in about an hour and let you know what's going to happen next. And in an hour, they say, well, we're not really sure yet, and we'll talk about it in another hour, you know, and ultimately a flight gets canceled. At the end of the day, something's happened. Parts broken, you know, whatever whatever the case may be. Um, it's interesting. Our work with AIA in the states suggests that 70% um, of the spend in aviation happens after an aircraft is delivered, and so it's no surprise that our recent survey results suggest that the OEMs are attempting to capture more of the MRO business. But the question is, who's the OEM? Okay, is it a major airframe manufacturer? like the Boeing Company, an engine manufacturer like General Electric, or Pratt Whitney, you know, those sorts of things. It becomes pretty complicated. And then at the end of the day, how do you actually deliver that service, that part and that labor to make sure that, in fact, you're meeting all the regulatory maintenance checks and fixing the part that's broken in such a manner that's cost effective? Everyone says we want more of that business, all right, but folks aren't exactly sure how to go get it, at least that's what it seemed like to me. So I want to talk a little bit about technology. I'm going to talk about just two technologies. We're a technology firm, so of course that's what we talk about. The first is <clears throat> big data and analytics. And answering the question, can we anticipate a failure before it occurs so that we are able to provision the material, the parts that are required, in a place where labor is available to repair an aircraft and keep it flying. Well, that's good for everybody. That's good for the folks of us that fly. That's good for the airlines that are operating aircraft because when you miss it, when a flight goes down, revenue impact is huge, you know, and, and this ripple effect through our air control systems, you know, or the fact that the planes don't get to place some of the individual passengers is pretty horrendous. And the answer is that today we can begin to do that. At CEC, leveraging our work with the United States Navy, we're beginning to develop and have developed some pretty interesting ways to analyze data, new data, um, that we can begin to predict when there might be a difficulty with an aircraft system, you know, hours in advance, so that we in fact can schedule maintenance repairs, you know, and keep aircraft running. Now that's good for everybody. That begins to answer the question, what do I know or can I determine when something may malfunction? The answer is yes, sometimes we can. Certainly not all the time. You know, but the closer we close that gap, the better off we're all going to be in terms of determining where we need to position our inventories, you know, how we can anticipate, almost as a concierge service, how we take care of aircraft and take care of aircraft, aircraft passengers, whatever the case may be. The next bit, ironically, leverages the supply chain. <clears throat> in a briefing uh, um, earlier this week, uh, a guy from Frost & Sullivan, really neat guy, had this bullet point 
it alluded to ERP, and later he said, well, it really doesn't answer the needs of MRO. And that's absolutely true. Because when you look at the supply chain in MRO, the question you're trying to answer is, and the supply chain, frankly, in aircraft build, at the, in the front part of the life cycle, is am I capable of delivering what I need to keep that aircraft in service? And that requires a different level of thinking, and I like to call it synchronization. Because at the end of the day, we need some pretty basic building blocks to keep our airplanes flying safely. We need to have, and I'm gonna focus just on the MRO business because there's a lot more involved for sure. But one is do I have the right part at the right place? Do I have the skilled labor to do it? Do I have a facility that is authorized and meets all the criteria for regulatory regulatory agencies? You know, and when you ripple that through OEMs and tier one suppliers and whatever the case may be, synchronizing that activity is absolutely the most critical thing that we can do. Now, it suggested that this industry has somewhere between 30, 40, 50 billion dollars in inventory sitting around the world. Now, no one really knows. And the reason we don't know is because we can't track where this stuff is, you know, which is the problem that you alluded to. You know? But imagine, imagine if we are able to understand what the aircraft requirement needs are and then synchronize that with where it's going. It is going to be a transformational opportunity for supply chain and MRO. It's going to change the way we look at this entire business in ways that, that we're doing today. We work with three or four companies already where we've integrated these solutions and the, re the results are amazing. Now, there are lots of reasons to do it. I want to be happy when I fly. I don't want to be delayed. I'll accept bad weather. And the rate had to be terrible, okay? A friend of mine was there for 36 hours on an air mattress. You know, that's pretty bad. But in terms of mechanical breakdown, I don't want that to happen. If it does happen, I want it to be repaired quickly enough so I can continue my journey and do so with as little disruption as possible. For the airlines, that means that they don't lose revenue. They don't lose revenue. That's a big deal. For everyone in the MRO business, it means that you can provide, if, when, if you take advantage of these capabilities, you can provide a better service and capture more market share. That means more revenue. Because at the end of the day, well, while we've got to keep the customers happy, for the companies that are represented here, you know, we've all got challenges about how do we grow. The good news is that in fact the technologies are in place today that can, I think, revolutionize, we use the word transform, this industry in ways that we haven't seen before. Um, and, and I'm pretty excited about that. So I'm probably at the end of my time. The clock's running down. I hope there are three universal truths. As the talk you're going to give, the talk you gave, and the one you wish you had given. So I hope that if there are questions at the end, it'll help make up for the stuff that I forgot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next up is uh, David Stewart, the Vice President and Head of the Aerospace and MRO Practice at ICF SHE. Testing, testing. Um, so uh, good afternoon, and um, looking forward to the discussion and uh, questions. Um, SHD much smaller than uh, my S1 colleagues here. We're um, just 100 people focusing entirely on aviation consulting, and I'm uh, I run their aerospace and MRO um, <coughs> line of business. Um, uh, lots of you know, similar themes going on here. And just thinking about it uh, from a, a, an OEM and an MRO perspective and the, the context of the supply chain, um, I mean, Obviously, the more complex the part, the more complex the supply chain, uh, then how the supply chain actually performs becomes more and more critical to the success of that industry. And you know, with aerospace, the parts are complex and the supply chain is very complex. So it has, in terms of delivery of the parts to the planes or the delivery of the parts to the, to the actual production line, it's extremely critical. Um, so the subject matter is, is quite important as a best practice. In the context of the macro trends going on, I mean, it's, it's not a trend anymore, it's DNA, whether you're a manufacturer or an airline or an MRO, is the pressure on the costs. So the OEMs, <coughs> Boeing, partial partnership for success, Airbus, Scope, UTC, UTD Squared, they're all after getting 15 to 20% costs out of 
their supply chain. Those, those, those initiatives are ongoing right now. In the, in the aftermarket, there's $47 billion worth of inventory out there supporting those planes right now. That's something like around about one to one and a half million dollars of inventory per aircraft. It's coming down with time, but with a carrying cost of 22%, that's costing the industry $10 billion. It can be done better, and hence there's that huge cost uh, pressure on MROs, on OEMs, and on the airlines. On the OEM side, there's, there's changes going on. Um, the supply chain, so the Airbuses and the Boeings as well, they're vertically integrating into the high technology areas. Um, Boeing, for example, is going into the one place, this centers of excellence in the cells and the pylons. And then at the tier ones, with the new planes, the 350 and the, 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 the 7X Infratum, they've been asked to take on the systems integration role. Uh, the design and development has been pushed down to them from Airbus and Boeing, and suddenly they're having to deal with their supply chain. Every time I go into an open component OEM at these air shows and I say, well, you're on top of two or three issues, managing their supply chain is right up there um, to get this right. The other sort of macro trend, I guess, in the US side is what I would make, maybe, maybe call right sourcing. There's been a lot of offshoring and sort of, you know, sending activities overseas to get market access by those OEMs. But slowly but surely, there's slight, slightly less rush than that. So some of the you know, three axes moving machines go overseas and fly back to stay closer to home. Um, so, but all of that means in this complex supply chain, it comes back to the two key best practices that my colleagues have mentioned. One is the data analytics. This is minimizing inventory and maximizing service. That's what it's about. Because that's what's driving the cost of the, of the airline. To do that, you've got to have the right talent, and you have to have the right tools. It used to be that operations research was some funny sort of scientific person sitting in a dark room that you didn't let out. You go to a Pratt and Whitney or somebody else like that, now operations research is front and center of their ability to manage that supply chain, to manage the capacity management of the by bottlenecks, etc. And coming back to that word transparency of the supply chain, and it's got to be on a global basis now, because this industry is now completely to global with the systems interfaces. The level of data sharing needs to sort of kind of go on. It's phenomenal. I suppose I'd, I'd kind of end up with a, a kind of a vision and a comparison. In the 1980s, the 1990s, though very on in the days of the, the Tarama Deus is this world of passenger data. The passenger data was absolutely core to an airline because the last thing they would give away is that passenger data because that's, that's their consumer. And with time, it's become a system. Everybody shares that information with us. So cross Amadeus, cross Sabre, et cetera, et cetera. And it's over the system that we're paying for. Today, the airlines, they keep their aircraft data, their configuration control, what's on that plane, because it's their asset. How about, in 15 years' time, all that information, with the, with the amount of data that you now have available on the 787, the 300, the 8350, and the Electronic capability of these, the sea enablement. All that data can be up there in the cloud with the plane. You know, you get my word. And it's suddenly accessible. Lessors know what's on that plane. That's their asset. They know what the configuration, what's happened to that plane. The, t the, the tech records inspection and phase in, phase out suddenly becomes easy. The regulators know what's going on in the plane. Boeing knows what's going on in their 787 and they can help figure and control and look at the operation. Suddenly that and everybody can have access to that information, it's neutralized, it's more efficient for everyone. So there's a vision that may or may not happen. And again, if anyone in the audience has questions, raise raise your hands. I'll I want to uh, start um, with one. You know, one of the things I don't think that was mentioned was the kind of the integrity of the parts that are in the supply chain. I mean, one of the issues that you know we worked on when I was at DOT. 20 years ago was, you know, counterfeit parts and, and non-certified parts. Um, and the challenge for that has to be much greater today than it was then, given that the supply chains have become more global, have become, um, you know, much less centralized. Is that something that, that, that your firms are looking at, or is it something your customers are more uh, responsible for? And, and how do you see that as a, an issue facing uh, aerospace today when it comes to supply chain management? 
At CSC, we have uh, a solution offering, and this is not meant to be a commercial, please, um, that looks at, at counterfeit parts. It's a really, uh, it's a really huge deal. Um, when you look at the need to ensure that we have a proper functioning part on an air, in an airplane, it's just like, you know, it's a price of entry. You can't, you just can't avoid, you know, that, that sort of situation. Um, interestingly enough, there's a, a parallel discussion about, you know, conflict minerals and those sorts of things. And I think that, you know, I, I know that the industry, whether it's a, and the engine guys, the airplane guys, whatever the case may be, are working hard at putting identifiers and indicators on all their parts. Um, but, so, I don't know there's a universal wrench. I don't really believe in those kinds of things. But the fact of the matter is, is that from an MRO system perspective, at a macro level, we absolutely have to have the security around that sort of, that sort of condition. And it's going to be a combined effort from a regulatory perspective, from an industry adopting some standards, you know, sharing configuration data, you know, all that sort of thing is going to, going to keep us safe. And it's going to require folks saying, yeah, that's really better. And I don't think we're that necessarily that far away, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it is, it is pretty pretty central um, in making sure we can fly safely. I, it is obviously critical, and I think you know, ultimately, kind of the word I have not heard the word bonus part mentioned for a while in you know in the sort of I mean, yes, PMA type of thing, but but clearly part of that is that I think it's working well on that front with all the paperwork very much just about. It. Can we make that whole process more efficient? You know, for example, that's the idea behind RFID. So I don't know whether it's Airbus or with the 350 or with the 787 or something at the time. You know, I've tried to make those planes RFID. So you think the OEM to get on the plane has to have RFID on it. It's one of those two, maybe both. And that would be a vehicle to getting this transparency. However, the, the three or four different RFID managers or different standards in terms of how they do it, and some different readers, and therefore you immediately kind of don't have that harmonization that you need to be able to achieve it on a, on a global basis. So we still have some of the lack of standardization that would enable us to, to make that supply chain more efficient. Well, um, it's an interesting one. Um, I've been working for AAR for about 14 years now, if my memory serves me well. Um, and in that time, I, I I don't believe I've uh, ever seen a, uh, what we could call a bogus part for that, for that matter. Um, but it is a risk, um, and for the corporation, safety is, um, is uh, critical. And so we have processes in place that ultimately um, help avoid or eliminate any potential exposure from the corporate side. Um, so you know, we invest heavily in terms of aircraft for teardown, etc. And so uh, the requirements for back to birth, etc., is, is critical because ultimately that's the investment uh, that, that was going to create the sales revenue. And then ultimately those, those parts will end up in, on aircraft, which obviously uh, the safety is, uh, is a, a huge enough. But that, for that matter, again, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a bogus part for want of a better term. Uh, Patrick? Given, given the global nature of the industry and the fact that the planes are flying literally around the world and therefore the parts have to be tracked around the world, are there any issues with cross-border data flows or how the information is being tracked or who has access to the information about where the parts are going and who's getting them and when they're getting them? Just if you can comment on whether or not that's a concern or an issue would just be interested. Thank you. In terms of the parts side of things, um, you know, we, we haven't adopted, we're looking into the RFID in terms of tracking certain, some of the key, key, um, uh, key part numbers that obviously have a significant cost. Um, so it's, it's, it's a bit early to be able to respond to that in terms of um, uh, knowing whether there are any governance issues or whether there's any lack of visibility in certain places. Um, I guess some of the exposure that we have on that side of it, we have various consignments inside, but it's not really necessarily too techni techni uh, technological. We haven't really uh, encountered any problems. Uh, typically, if, we, if it's not doing, being done ourselves and then visible in our own system, then we're doing it with a partner and it's visible in their system. Um, but we haven't had any you know, cross-border problems in terms of ensuring the visibility of the parts. Um, unlike passenger data, what we're worried about, folks don't care about parts so much. And the commercial aspect of this kind of kind of mitigates that whole scenario. So if 
Airbus builds a part in France and they're concerned about data in France about that part, it'll likely stay there for the part. But once that part is sold to an MRO provider, you know, the location, you know, bill of materials, whatever the case may be about that part, kind of goes with it. And it's really, I'd say, almost almost unquestioned. Um, so it's an interesting an interesting topic. And I hate to like open that can of worms because imagine what we have to do track all that stuff too. And by the way, it's Airbus and the A350, it's RFID to everything. Okay, so, uh, but, but from my perspective, from what we see, there really hasn't been a lot of, a lot of pressure in that area yet. <coughs> I, I agree, I haven't seen anything in terms of national borders on um, sort of complications of the data flow. Um, you know, sort of, uh, ultimately, each of those parts has got an owner. Um, so probably the fact that that part is is in one of their assets would be in their maintenance system um, and what, when, when it take comes off or off the plane. The main thing is that that, that back to birth documentation is associated with it so you don't have the bonus part problem. And so it has, as far as I'm aware, it's not been an issue with what it's going. You get some sensitivities within particular airlines if they're, if they're contributing parts to a pool, they put their part in the pool which has got you know, a mod status which is nice, fancy, and new, and they get back a part which is less fancy and less new. You get some kind of problems on that front, but it's not a it's not a regulatory thing, and it's not a it's, it's not a governance type of thing. You know, and it's, you get some sort of transparency and process issues around that sort of thing, but otherwise, it's not an issue. And then maybe building on on on, on Patrick's question a bit. Um, and talk about, you know, are there, you know, sovereignty issues in terms of uh, optimizing the supply chain? I mean, we heard from the, uh, you know, the panel on aviation security um, that, that there are, you know, there's, there's uh, ICAO Annex 17 and then there's, there, there's other sovereignty issues where the governments aren't going to cooperate um, necessarily. Yet, you know, uh, John, you just mentioned that, you know, parts don't care about their personal data as much as people do. So is that true throughout the supply chain where the sovereignty issues aren't as impeding a optimization of the system as they might be in the aviation security regime? Or are there other issues where US law might be conflicting with you know, PRC law, which might be uh, conflicting with, 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 with Japanese law, and so that you have to design a supply chain around the regulatory process uh, as much as you do around what the customer wants. I and mean, certainly from, you know, when I was at UPS, customs was the biggest issue that we probably had to face um, when it came to optimizing the supply chain. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm a supply chain guy, all right, in aerospace and defense, and so I can't, uh, maybe somebody else here can speak, speak to, to the legal issues. I think you really hit the nail on that as a customs question, you know, and so I would, I'll kind of look at it this way. Um, in, in this region, in the next, I forget what, 10 or 15 years, we're going to add 12 to 13,000 new airplanes. So that's 24 to 26,000 new engines. You, know, you kind of get the math. I like the Captain Obvious stuff. Um, every country or that has a dom plays a dominant role in this industry is going to want to be able to have a share of the MRO business. Because it's I mean, I think those constituents and the companies that are in it are going to begin to continue to drive how this all works. I really think that's what's going to be the, the, the driving force. And likely it's going to be customs. Okay. The fascinating discussion even on, on Monday was, you know, at most we're only 24 hours away from delivering a part from anywhere in the world. So, you know, this industry's got some inter interesting features that say that we can respond very, very quickly. The preference is to anticipate and have what we, where we need it. But the fact of the matter is the resilience of this industry is pretty remarkable. And so I think that's going to be, those are going to be kind of the overriding, the overriding factors as we design uh, MRO systems and, and truly link up supply chains. Um, uh, to echo um, my colleagues here, uh, points uh, it's 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 definitely not a sovereignty issue that you're exposed to it's it's always the custom side of things you know we've had um, historical issues when we've uh, tried to open up for, for example uh, aircraft teardown or engine teardown you know when you see the um, uh, the customs 
uh, obviously have a recognition that there's an, a major asset that's going in and in many respects parts are coming out. Um, so, you know, the, those regulatory authorities don't tend to have rules and regulations that to surround that. So, um, when we talk about, uh, I kind of alluded a little bit earlier, talk about like China, um, we tend to find, we do a lot of uh, um, uh, data analysis in terms of where to, uh, to optimize, where's the optimization in terms of the uh, location of parts. And we want to put parts into China. Um, but in many respects, it's actually quicker to work in, from Singapore or elsewhere than in China itself. Because obviously every single city tends to have its own customs department and um, they don't necessarily have the, 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 where we say they don't necessarily distinguish a banana from an aircraft part, whatever's critical. That's not an insult in any way, it's just the way it's sort of, the, the, it's there. So you're basically in a queue. Um, you know, the, the systems available today can get a part from A to B, from the US to, to, to Asia in, in, in less than a couple of days. You're not necessarily supporting an AOG, um, but you can ultimately, you know, feature highly in terms of uh, meeting the customer's requirements. But the customers ultimately have got to be uh, a little bit more flexible in that respect. All right, well, I actually was going to come back. I was going to ask, ask Paul if he could elaborate. I think you, you said that, uh, you, you're, I mean, you know, one of the lessons is, you know, or, or a strategy is to be careful not to optimize an inefficient uh, supply chain. What is most of what you see that is inefficient today that people may not even realize is, is inefficient in their supply chain? Um, that's a pretty, that, that, that could be pretty broad. Um, I guess one of the key examples, and, and you know, we can use uh, ourselves as an, uh, as an, an example, um, you know, ultimately you can have, uh, you know, one of the elements uh, is uh, data, uh, IT solutions, that's a, that's a key, key factor in terms of ensuring that you have the visibility. Um, but you may have got necessarily, or you may have developed, we have developed, for example, our own system and our IT uh, department has all ultimately fallen in love with that. Um, there are other solutions out there that would have ultimately uh, given us uh, you know, better performance, but all, we were tending to build on the IT solution we developed over and over again, and you tend to end up with a fat cat that's a little bit slow. Um, so when you're looking at the your whole supply chain solution, just that one element can ultimately make the, uh, uh, you know, make the system crumble. In, 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 in John, I mean, maybe in terms of using those analytics to know where to position parts, I mean, is there, are there things holding that back? Um, I think it's adoption. You know, uh, we've been hearing about big data, industry term, next-gen computing, cloud, all this kind of stuff. Um, there is an aspect of this industry that's pretty, in pretty slow late adopters in business systems. It's also an industry that's about the most advanced in terms of of using technology for the development of aircraft, you know, whatever the case may be. So, um, I think it is true today that there are new classes of software that will deliver results that are much more comprehensive than building on some of the old stuff. Um, and it's a matter of finding and recognizing that value. Now, it's incumbent on the suppliers and the services to make that, that value that value apparent. But the questions continue to be pretty simple. What are you capable of doing? When you peel that down, do you have a material method or machine? available to do it. Now that sounds simple. I'll tell you the ERP doesn't answer that question, but other tools do. And so in this industry, I, I have companies we, we work with that have taken new approaches to answer the call of the Boeing company or other, other manufacturers to ramp up and are doing so looking holistically at their, their supply chain. Tier ones, ironically, as they've assumed the role of systems solution providers, are adopting more quickly than the major OEs, the airframe guys. Um, and some of the folks who deliver technolo higher technology uh, solutions like the engine manufacturers are doing some of the same. So it's kind of interesting to me that uh, we, we see, that we see this, sort of, this sort of shift. Um, but I think it's absolutely true about the, the fan can thing. You can only add so much to ERP before it, does, it really just crumbles over your under its own weight. And it's kind of more of the same theme. I think you're asking, well, how, how do you get better at supply chain management? I think part of the issue is that you are dealing with a, an act in a, in a supply chain that's dealing with an active fleet, the mature fleet, which is huge, and it works the way it works. And so, um, and you kind of disrupt that, you know, with. With, with caution because 
those planes would be flying down to um, But you have the new technology planes coming, and there's an opportunity to change the way you do things. So, um, and suddenly you'll find, oh, and British Airways doesn't want to do the, 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 the maintenance on the A380. Oh, JAL can outsource its component maintenance to Lufthansa Technic on the 787. And so you get this opportunity to change the way you do it. And in the old way, you've got, I mean, you re recognize it, it, it's slightly inefficient because this is a very fragmented industry. There's a shed load of planes out there, and the average fleet size is only seven or eight, ultimately. Um, so by definition, you, you carry quite a lot of support all of that. But you can consolidate all of that, and so the, you get more of the work being done by bigger trading NROs, or an Airbus, or a Boeing, or an AAR. You actually get, you can drive, there is if great efficiency in inventory, or, or scaling out the inventory and, and having it in one place. So these new planes, <coughs> the technology that's coming in, will be able to drive that cost out of it and provide the opportunity for change. Um, but it's damn difficult to change it for kind of those uh, hundreds of uh, uh, 737s knocking around Africa. Yeah, kind of rather this note, it's like what I meant to say. <laughs> There's this whole, this whole notion of power by the hour that is, is, is changing the way the industry looks at itself. And I think under the, under the you know, as engine providers or airframe providers, or lessors, or whatever the case may be, be to, to, to sell their, their components, their products, their aircraft in a power by the hour, hour mode, it's going to change the way the provider of that service looks at how they do it pretty dramatically. And I honestly believe that, you know, that that is going to be one of the most dramatic shifts in terms of how we can see the industry consolidate a little bit from this huge fragmentation. And it may, in fact, reach backwards into some of the older aircraft. You know, the life cycle is really, really long. But, but that whole notion, and we see everybody doing it. You know, the airframe, the, the major uh, airplane companies, the engine manufacturers, you know, the wheels and brakes guys, the avionics guys, you know, it's how can I deliver my part of the system, you know, against an SLA that assures that the flying, the flying public is gonna take off and land, and that sort of thing. And I think that is a, a market shifting event that uh, it's, I know the customers we work with are talking about an awful lot. It really does change the way Look at how you deliver that MRO service. I mean, the, the, the CEO of, of UPS would, would say that you know companies who get it compete on their supply chain. If their supply chain beats, if our supply chain beats your supply chain, we're going to beat you. Um, it, so is that happening now in, in in MRO, or is it something that's coming, or have the have the better companies in you know Airbus, Boeing have already started doing that? I, I know that, that there are some of the, uh, the major suppliers that are doing it today. Okay, they're using data analytics to become predictive and, and to ensure higher service levels. And in fact, some of them, have, they have a variety of strategies. Okay? I know that there are tier ones supplying uh, the Boeing Company, Embraer, and Bombardier, and, and Airbus, and what have you, that are using the synchronization techniques um, that I talked about to manage the supply chain from tier one through raw materials to deliver kits and packages for the assembly of uh, the Dreamliner and the, and, the, and the A350 and others, and engine containment units and those sorts of things. So the fact of the matter is that there are companies that are doing that, and some of them that I see doing it, in fact, are using their supply chain to beat the other guys. They're winning more business because they can assure their customer that they are going to deliver their kit and if there's an issue, they know internally exactly what, exactly what to do. Um, and it, it's pretty remarkable. Those companies that do it, like the CEO of UPS, they're winning. Okay, and this, this is a kind of a lagging sort of industry, but I believe that there's some momentum kind of happening. People are gonna start asking the question, why does company A keep winning this sort of business? You know, and, and pretty soon, uh, folks, are gonna, folks are gonna catch on. Um, yes, um, but there are also some that are pretty damn bad, actually. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's not get to the Nirvana too quickly. Um, and, it, and, and especially the aftermarket. I, mean, uh, the, I, I, I quite like the, um, the, the picture of, for production, it's a little bit like a ballet. You know from the start to the finish what steps you're going to do and when. 
aftermarket, it's a bit like ice hockey, really. The only thing you know is the kickoff, and that's it, and it's pandemonium, <laughs> which is why AAR is so successful. You know, know this game, it's very different. Um, and you know, particularly the, the, some of the tier ones where you've got consolidation going on, there's been lots of M&A uh, in firms like Cobham and uh, uh, Goodridge over the years, Hampton Sons, etc. They, 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 they've combined their business, they've got separate businesses, doing different products. And so they've, they've got that challenge of getting, I'm not saying they're bad at their logistics, but companies like that, pulling in across lots of different businesses that they've acquired over the last five years, creates a real challenge to bring that all together in one <coughs> place, because they used to be tracking it from multiple different, you know, they've got multiple facilities all over the world. And so getting the logistics right, getting that optimization right, is why these operations research people that I referred to earlier suddenly come out of their little cubby hole. Um, and it's vitally important. So we've still got a long way to go. Well, if you consider from a PBH perspective, um, I don't think you're just going to see a major shift, which is, I guess, a, a sad statement to, to say. Um, you're going to continue to see the, the, uh, the dominant forces. Um, from a PBH basis, uh, the, the economies of scale uh, only work when you have the, the volume of inventory. So to be able to get to that level, it takes a long time or a huge amount of investment. Um, and when I say it's a, sta a sad statement, there are some obviously some small, small um, um, innovative companies that have some great supply chain solutions that are available, but ultimately hindered from the fact that they don't have the pooling. So uh, for the foreseeable future, it's, it's probably going to be the same, uh, the same faces, so to speak. Um, hopefully they will adopt some of the elements of the uh, the newer technologies available. In, 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 in that supply chain, is it going to be, are, are, are people keeping supply chain in-house or are they starting to outsource more and more of their supply chain or going to some pooling and uh, solution? It, it's interesting. Um, I did a speak uh, a few months ago and had a slide up there. there was a, I pulled it from, uh, from one of the OEMs. Um, outsourcing is the trend. Um, it's ultimately from an MRO and airline perspective, they, they predicted that by 2018, 2019, that most, the majority uh, uh, will be outsourced uh, to a supply chain, ultimately, essentially to eliminate the risk and ultimately um, you know, uh, to, to be able to get, uh, capture the, uh, the, the cost savings available. I suggest that when we did our survey with AIA, then we asked that question, um, we were split right down the middle. 50% of the folks said I'm an outsource, and 50% said I'm an insource. You know, so I think we don't know yet. We're still arm wrestling. We're still arm wrestling. Um, and, you know, I think that there are lots of forces that come to play. If the financial guy is looking at the, the question, he may say, gee whiz, outsourcing is just easier and look what I can do. But if it's the guy, that, the, the team that recognizes that, that, that uh, service comes from supply chain excellence and MRO excellence, is looking at, they're going to say, Jewish, do I want to risk my business, my reputation on, on an outsourcer and bet that an SLA is going to work or not? You know, I, so that's kind of, I think the jury's still out on all of this. So. Um, I might, it, it depends on the activity, it depends who you are. So we talk airlines, um, split it into four main ones. Um, line maintenance, 85% in-house, unlike to change very much because it's such an operational room important thing, but if anything, it will be more outsourcing. Engines, only 20% of engine maintenance is done in-house these days. It's got down to that level. It's only going one way, more to the OEMs, because they're doing the flying hour agreements that I mentioned earlier. And it's hugely expensive to set up capability for engine maintenance. You only do it if you're big, ugly, and it's an Emirates that's got plenty of money for it, okay? Um, component maintenance, it, you've got 30,000 parts flying around in and it makes no sense at all unless you've got scale to do that in-house. So the trend there is towards integrated services. You give it to an Airbus, a Boeing, an AAR, a Lufthansa Technic, and SL Technics because you want you don't want to invest in the, in the spares or the or the, tech, or the test equipment to do it. The business case is not there anymore to do it unless you've got scale. And by the way, if you go into buying our agreement, it's you've got big cash flow and less investment risk. So. That way, it's going to, that's going to outsource more the components. Airframe maybe maintenance, it depends. You've got a very, very competitive <coughs> third-party marketplace out there, um, and 
is labour rate driven. So the trend will be towards outsourcing, except in Asia, where it's cheap labour anyway. So literally, in Asia, 80% of airframe in Wales is done in house. In the US, only 45%. It just kind of depends where you are. So the trend is towards outsourcing um, to your big MROs. To your point, you've got to find somebody that's secure, stable. So scale is important. Track record is good. It's important. Quality is important. And price is important. Hey, so we're coming up to the end of the session, so I ask one last question for each of you. I think Gregory and his uh, in, the, in the panel before in aviation security said, you know, there's no single bullet when it comes to, to aviation uh, security to fix our problems. I guess there might be a silver bullet when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, to, to spare parts, whereas if you can have 3D printing, right, you just <laughs> print up the part at the, uh, at the gate and you give it to the mechanic, you're done. Now that may be a little bit down the road. So until we get to that silver bullet and assuming that we're never going to get customs really where we need it to be in terms of being able to move parts freely within within countries, let alone between countries. Um, what is it that, 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 that uh, you know, your customers can be doing, uh, the people you're advising to, to, to get to a more efficient supply chain? That's a, that's a challenging question. Um, because the, the customer base varies uh, enormously from, uh, it's been mentioned, you know, from, from the MRO side, you've got the aircraft maintenance, you've got the engine maintenance, you've got the airlines. So everyone has different, um, I guess, uh, aspirations and influences on that side of things. Um, what we tend to, I guess, tend to, to advise, uh, of course, you know, being an AR and holding the, holding the parts, we tend to tell people that it's a great idea to outsource. Um, that, that's the honest truth. That's why I wear the uh, Don the sales hat. <laughs> um, but in truth, it's uh, you know it's uh, you know we do say to people you know uh, you know uh, you know because it, we want to see people grow because if people grow then we can uh, we can capture uh, you know capture more opportunities. So we do tell people to ultimately look at their their entire system, their workflows in terms of understanding how they can improve their internal systems. Uh, um, we do have, you know, consultative services that ultimately talk about the MRO side of things and do exactly that. Um, so it, it's a it's a mixed bag, really. It's a you know it's a comment for all. It can change and vary between you know whoever you're talking to. But uh, advice is there sometimes. Yeah, I, I don't I don't believe in silver bullets. Okay. I'm a little, a little more pragmatic. However, I would suggest the promise of uh, big data and analytics is just enormous. Um, we're seeing that every day. We're just seeing it every day. And so if you begin to answer the question, predict what something's going to happen, then you can provision more quickly and keep things running. And a small difference, 2% change in uptime, is enormous in this industry. Just enormous. So it's not after going after big aerial goals. It's like making a, a movement in the, that's going to drive the dial differently. And for both the MRO part of this and for you know, the rest of the supply chain, you know, if I were, we challenge our clients to stop looking at, at, a, at a forecast push kind of models and start looking at demand tr triggers and demand pull sorts of things and realize <coughs> that for, for 40 years we've been doing MRP looks at material. In fact, that's only one fourth of what gets the job done. You need to begin to look at the other elements, whether it's repairing an aircraft or building a component or building an aircraft make it happen, and that's method, machine, and material. So that is, you know, kind of an answer. Not meant to be a universal, universal wrench, okay? But when clients start to look at things just a little bit differently, the value they can generate for their customers is just enormous. I don't know whether it's gold, silver, or copper. I'm not sure. Um, but here's a hypothesis anyway. So you've got that capability out there. <coughs> Uh, John's mentioned, but how do you enable that? And that has got to be make the data transparent. If we can find a silver bullet that makes the data transparent and available so you can leverage that data to do the analytics, then that surely, as I say, I don't know whether it's gold, copper, or silver, but it'll help a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, it is exactly 3.50, and since this is a panel on just in time, uh, we, we came just in time into to the, to the close of our panel, so if you will, can we give a, a, a round of applause for our three panelists?